Oh, it was absolutely to have a job in Fords. It was just something else. You were you were considered mayor for life, basically, because the plant had been there since uh, nineteen seventeen, and generations of people had worked there, and it's kind of it carried on down through the air. Somebody's son might come in. If something happened, I think there was one gentleman and his father was um, was killed in the foundry in, in, in Fords. And he was he actually joined the, the firm when he was quite young. So they did look after their employees. The pay was good. For Henry Ford always maintained that um, by increasing pay, you got better workers. And it was true. And um, we had only the one shift in Cork. You had regular pay, you had regular overtime, you had pension, and it was, you thought if you went in there at 18, you expected to be there until you retired. Security, that was the, that was the main thing. It, it, it was uh, obviously one of the best jobs in Cork. Um, that, that was the main thing, it was security. Uh, but then you became part of the Ford family. Uh, took about, Six months maybe before you got into that into that kind of grip, like, and then once you're part of the family, uh, and even to this day, you still meet your colleagues from Fords, and they they were they you know it's 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 like a, it's like a big Ford family. Well, at the time, it was probably one of the best jobs in the city. Fords Owen, Dunlops were good. The examiner office, they were all fairly good jobs at the time. You know what I mean paid your wages, it paid the way, and it sent, it sent boxes down to Crosshaven to be made into chalets and things. And as I said, when I, when I told him I was getting the job in Fords, he said throw away the manager of a job for life, because Fords had a good reputation as an employer, like they, they, they were, the money was always good. Oh, it was, like I thought, you, job for life is what I thought, and now that's it, I'm set now. You know, I'm sitting out of it because it was the Fords and Dunlops. Like if you got in there, you are. Before we say um, Pfizer's were out now and there's a few of the chemical factories going, Fords is the best to get into, you know. The Ford wage at that time was higher than uh, a tradesman would earn anywhere around the city. Even tradesmen with good trades came in and worked in Fords because the Ford uh, the Ford waves was much higher. You could purchase a car from, from Fords and uh, you'd get a, a, quite a substantial discount if you bought a new car, but that was a lot of money. But that went back to the kind of Ford philosophy that he'd pay a good wage, Henry Ford, uh, enabling a person to have good living conditions and in turn they would have enough money to buy a car. Uh, if a person bought a car then of course um, it got special treatment. It was known as a special. And of course, there was a very elaborate piece of equipment put in the car to tell us this. So the car would come down and you would have a hook with a piece of sandpaper, the same colour of the car, on it. And you look, this was the special. We say this was John O'Connell's car or whatever. This was a special. So he got the extras. We might put a little arm into it. Uh, he'd get the, be the better trim. He'd have the gear trim now. He'd have the best trim and chrome, best of stuff. Uh, he might get an extra quarter paint, maybe even extra two quarts of paint. So it, if you got the special, it had a lot of extras there. And uh, there was kind of a blind eye turned to that, like that's just okay, there's a few extra bits going on that, that's all right, you know. Because management were in the same position, if they bought a car and they came down, well, they could be looked after as well. It was fantastic. Uh, obviously, I was quite young when I went in there, 1971, it was 20, 20, 22 or 23. I hadn't much work experience. But I've never experienced anything since that was anything like the working experience in Fords. The people there were absolutely fantastic. There was every type of person there. Um, mostly good. 99.9% .9 fantastic people. Friendly, obliging and all uh, uh, great fun there. But, you know, the work had to be done too, so that was that was done as well. The size of it, number one. We'd never been working in anything like that, like it was, it was a huge, and the amount of people. It was, it, was, it was the bones of a thousand people there that time. 
Um, it was just a, the hustle and bustle going on all the time around the place. You know, everybody was moving, doing something. That was the thing about it. It was routine. Everything, it, 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 there was people there had the same job for over 40, 50, 40 years and doing the same job day in, day out. Um, the, I, I would say it was never boring, never ever boring. Um, there was always something, something going wrong or something happening or you know, some fella to be slagged about something that happened over the weekend or whatever. Uh, but um, the, the, the process was the same every single day. Everything had to be done according to the book and that's the way it was done. And if your job was, was to do that over, over a, a 10, 15, 20 year period, that was it. So in fours, you didn't do any one thing? Like, I was, you were allocated to a certain line and you normally stayed in that. Whether it was the paint shop, the body shop, the trim line, the chassis line, there was various sections. So I was actually in the trim line. So we done a lot of finishing to the inside of the car. Whether you were putting heaters into the car, which is what I done at one stage. So you go to your workstation, because the car was constantly moving. Because you were doing 10 cars an hour. So 80 cars a day was what was produced in a normal day. And uh, of course the first thing you do is you have to get all your stuff, all your heater assemblies, all the pipes, uh, the heater controls, and you put all those into the car, you threw the mat in, you followed it of course, you lay down, you had your air gun, and you, you were basically assembling the car, that was your part of the assembly. Well the thing that's working life was grand because um, I, I found it fairly straightforward, in the sense like they had a routine. I mean, one car was the same as the next, and once you got a, a system, you were, you could stay going, you know? Normally we would work an eight-hour day. Sometimes, if we were busy, if the car sales were good, we'd work um, nine hours. You were doing a car every, every eight minutes or ten minutes, depending on how their schedules fitted in. You might have to fit um, headlights on a car, and every eight minutes, you moved into the next car. You had your stock prepared on, on the bench, maybe there, on the side, and you went in and you did that. Next one came up, you did the same thing, exactly the same thing. It was monotonous, but it got to a stage where you could only do it in your sleep. So it was, it was no bother in that sense, there was no pressure. You know, no, if you were changed to a different location, then you had some different jobs to do and took a few days to get used to that. But at least at that stage, you were used to the motion of the line, you knew what you had to do. So it was just getting used to what you were fitting and how they were fitted and all that. You'd have muscle memory and you could, you know, no problem. You could think about other things and do the job. It was noisy, but not very noisy. And one of the good things about the place was that it was, um, it was dry in there. You didn't have any, you didn't have any rain or wind or anything like that. It was, it was always reasonably comfortable. You could always feel safe in there. Very few people were ever injured or anything like that. And there was a doctor on, in the plant anyway, if you, if you needed any kind of assistance. Well, I thought it was fantastic. I must say, it was, uh, it was one job you didn't mind going into. You just got up, went in. The conditions were good, really, I suppose. Like, you know, you got an overall every so any time you wanted. Like every Monday morning there was a clean overall there, and if you wanted another one, like, during the week, it'll be, you could get one too. Uh, we started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it was a clock in system, yeah. Uh, up, up to, well, half past four was the official finishing time, but um, there was the, an optional overtime to up to half past five, which most of us did. Then you could be um, working until nine o'clock at night and overtime. And then come the end of the quarter, you could be there Saturday, Sunday, you know, it could be there almost there 24 hours, which we which we did on a few occasions. It was quite strict in, 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 in the sense that it had to be in quality, it was paramount, of course. So you couldn't do a kind of a rough shot. I mean, you'd hear stories about people saying that was a Monday morning car. Or that, that, that was a pure fallacy, like, because everything had to go through strict procedure and everything had to be checked rigor, rigorously, you know, and before a car would be released. In the 1960s and 70s, and yeah, we used to we used to road test the cars out here. We would go up and down the wharf, 
turn right down at the end of the Dunlop buildings and there was a road down here which, that we would go down to the end of that, back up again, check the steering wheel to see everything was okay, the brakes were okay and then back up and in for final finish and any extra repairs that had to be done. There was there was a lot of social activities went on there as well. There was like there was interdepartment football every year. The tops of the town when it was going, uh, pitch and put. Well, there was every sport was catered for. There was a, the soccer club, the GA club, golf club, pitch and put club, bowling club. There was tops of the town. I think there might uh, there was a, di uh, a, di a deep sea diving club. The workers would have been members of different clubs. You, you had um, you had the pike fishing clubs, you had the sea angling clubs, and uh, you, you, you had the boat angling as well. They had had a very good uh, soccer team in the, prior to the 60s that had played and they had won the FAI Cup, uh, Fordsons, but they always had very, very good soccer players. They had people who would have played, had experience uh, in the League of Ireland, like Tommy Collins, there was a lot of very good. So when it came to the soccer teams, if you look at any of the, the photographs and you go along, every second one was factory, office, manager, you know, they were all, and uh, the same happened within um, the GA. And then you had, uh, you had Tops of the Town. Tops of the Town was, um, was uh, a commercial thing run by players, cigarettes. Singing and dancing and all this, a show like, just a full show like, uh, that uh, different, it was for um, factories and businesses like that, uh, that were willing to, Sunbeam had one now, Sunbeam was going at the time and awards and all the different um, people around, you know, they would um, get a group together. And we always had uh had the tops of the town unit in fourth, you know, certain fellows and we'd write scripts and all the fellows would produce and then all the members of the cast, a kind of a review sort of thing, they'd all be members of Fords or Ford families. And uh, that was great fun, that came up every year. There was a lot of rehearsals and a lot of nights in the pub after the rehearsals and um, sometimes you might even find it hard uh, in the middle of a show when just before people went on the show to get them out of the pub because there were but it, it, there was a lot of uh, social activity. But I, what I do remember is if you if you uh, took a break maybe and you went upstairs um, there was a lot of people playing drafts. People were very big into drafts at the time and uh, some people just get quite quite. Uh, angry if they lost the game because with the game of drafts like you, you could capture one man you could lose five and lose the game and often some fellow would get pretty upset and the ball would be kicked up in the air you know be happy about that at all he thought he was going to win the game like the next thing he was being set up for a move and lost the whole lot you know but I think they had monster champion drafts players and everything there like but uh, there was a lot of interest there and there were there were people in four that you could that you could depend on for to give you advice on almost anything. I was involved with, with photography at the time and um, there was always four or five people there that, that you knew you could depend on if you wanted any kind of help in any way. No matter what you wanted to know, you had somebody working a force who was an expert on it. When I was there, when I bought my house, that I had lived in for 40 years afterwards or more. There was an awful lot to be done. I had plumbing to do, I had plastering to do. I knew nothing about those trades, but I had experts and they could tell me there was plumbers, there were plasters. They could tell me do this and do that. And I was able to walk away. You could follow your own pursuits and have your own um have your own hobbies and things like that, and you didn't have any um, worries. Whereas, if you were working for other companies or even for yourself, you were, you had to make a choice. Like the, the hobby had to take second place when it came to things. But I um, met a guy down there one time, and he uh, talked me into uh, getting involved in parachuting. 
okay? He did three jumps and I finished up doing a lot, a lot more. Well, you know, the first time I did it, <laughs> I can remember the first jump I did was my reaction was when I left go of the strut was, Jesus, why did you go for? And after that, it was elation, you know? So the whole thing was assembly. The whole thing moved on these kind of joint, uh, we say chains, and the cars were placed where we were. No, we were working just on the body. The, the track it would take the car over your head and to, to take it along. You know, to, some of it went over. The lads underneath would have to be underneath the car, and they'd put up the drive shaft and put on the wheels and the side. And there'd be fellas putting on the wheels and the side, and like it would start in in the body shop. You see, like, like originally, like, and to go into the paint shop, then it would be painted, and then the body would be, the, the suspensions would be put up on the line. I'm on the left hand side of the line, and I'm holding the front suspension, and there is a man on the other side, and he's holding the other suspension, and he's also dropping the body. And then the body would be dropped down over the suspensions and then to go to the next stage. It could be hard grinding work. It was non-stop. It was, it was, and yet it was never heavy work. That you never had to lift something that was beyond your capabilities. Everything you were capable of doing. But if you were good at your job, if you were, if you were fairly good with your hands, you would find that the supervisor would see this and he would stick more work on here. And eventually you wouldn't have half a minute to spare from the time you go from one car to the next. And you're coming under pressure all the time because this thing, there was, there was pressure there all the time because there was always another car coming. You might be trying to work your way back the line if that was possible at all so that you could maybe go for a toilet break. But it, it, there was always this, this sublime pressure. The line was never ending. Just kept coming and coming and coming all the time. Totally sold the strain. I mean, we wouldn't be the only one working on the line like that. You know, four or five or six people doing the same type of job. Like I mean, you'd be doing uh an average about eight to ten cars an hour, so, and to, to depend on whether the car was a two door or a four door. It's four door, four doors to hang instead, or two doors to hang on your side because you had the guy on the opposite side who hung the other side. It was pressurised, and when I when I initially when I started, I said to myself, "How am I going to manage this?" I just couldn't see myself doing that amount of work. Like you can imagine, they going into your local mechanic and saying to him, well, your job now today is to put in um, 80 windscreens and 80 rear screens. That was the kind of amount of work you had to do. And that just would give you some indication. The line would stop if, um, if something went wrong. For instance, if they didn't have the wheels on and the car was going down onto the flat, they would, um, somebody would have to stop the line. It was nearly a mortal sin if you had to stop the line. That, because they'd lose production. I mean, if they'll stop for five minutes, that could be a cow in the day. There would be uproar then. Supervisor would be coming out of the woodwork almost, looking for to, to see who, who had stopped the line. You could see the red lights going on and uh, they, they appeared and uh, there could be a lot of shouting and roaring. The line would have been stopped where if there was a problem, you say, if they discovered there was... It was very seldom, no, because the, the quality control seemed to be quite good. Of course, we all prayed for the day when something happened to the motor on the line and the line couldn't function. And then the maintenance men were called and there was a fierce tizzy because every, uh, every few minutes that went by, they were going to lose a car, like. You know, because there's ten cars an hour, so if there was six minutes gone, there was a car off the production, there were only car leg, and that affected all the other lines going down. So the next one then, from the trim line, as I said, was the chassis line. So, you know, if the car wasn't there, if it was held up, it would create a space, you see. So if the, the line stopped, a space would have been created, and as the line kept on going, the next line, 
So each six minutes there was a car. That was six minutes, that was two cars. So there was a, we used to pray for us, it would give us a break, you know. So if there was a break then, if there was a fault somewhere along the line and there was a gap, that was a great break then. You know, it might be a fault back the line, they'd have to stop the line or maybe stop some of the cars before they'd get, get the fault rectified and then to come on again. But during that time, there was a great old break, like, so you made the best of it. Oh, there was a button. There was a, there was, on, let's say on the chassis line, there was probably uh, three different places where you could actually stop the line. Now, the assembly worker wasn't supposed to do that, I would think, but that's how it worked out most of the time. You had to do it. In, in the evening, fellas would, would, would be brushing to get out of the car park to get away fast because with 800 people coming out, you know, it'd be chock a And he used to get a spin, he had in the car, but he used to get a spin. And he'd go down what we used to call the lower level, which was nearer to the gate. So that when the bell went, he'd make a dash, he'd be out the gate. And he went down one day, and every so often there'd be a clamp down. Don't go near the clocks, don't go down until half past four. You're not to be queuing up at the clocks. So he, he ducked downstairs, and the next thing the supervisor came along and he saw him coming and he jumped into a car. There'd be cars on that I wouldn't be finished, you know, it'd be jobs to be done and he jumped into the car anyway. And um, he ducked down inside in the car and your man passed on and next thing the bell went and he went to open the door and there was no handles on the inside of the car and he couldn't get out of the car. Let me out, let me out, let me out. And no one would leave him out for black yarding. <laughs> we, had, we had two guys who, who were bleeding brakes because to bleed brakes you need you needed two people. You needed one guy up on top to press the pedal, and you needed another guy down below who had to open the four bleeders. There was a bleeder on each road wheel. So Arthur was down below. Arthur would open the, the bleeders, one, two, three, four, we, with a pipe into each, and this was drained off into, um, into some kind of storage tank. Jack was up on top, and Jack put the um, a connection onto the onto the brake master cylinder. Then he went back into the car and he would press the brake furiously to get the brake fluid in and get the bubbles out of the thing. And when he was finished, he'd shout down to Arthur, Arthur! Arthur would go down underneath and close off his um, his bleeders and hang up his, his pipes again. And for a while, they fell out over some incident or all. So they couldn't they couldn't speak about it anymore. So the communication was all done by, by taps and you'd hear Jack would tap when he had a, a, the brake fluid ready to go and Arthur would tap when he was finished and um, and all the air was out of the system. So and this went on for several years. And yet they had been great friends, and they were again at a later stage. There was another shop steward who shall remain nameless. Uh, he was uh, he, he, he was fairly militant gentleman, and we were uh, there was a picket outside the gate one day, and there was this eighteen wheel truck came down delivering uh, parts to Ford, and he lay down in front of the truck, and he looked up at the driver, and he said. Roll over me now and you're a dead man. So, <laughs> so there was things like that. You know, um, it, was, it was hilarious that, that, that you know, um, everybody, the nicknames there were, 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 nearly everybody had a nickname anyway to start with. That I know the beers weren't that common, you know. And he, he had a beard, he was a musician too. And, um, this other chap, McField, said one day, look at him, he's like a fuzzy wuzzy. And it stuck. And from then on, he was ever known as the Fuzzmaz. And he brought out a record not too long before he died, a year or two before he died, and he called it Fuzzmaz Music, was the title he had on the, on the CD. There was a small little fella called uh, the Parrot. He was a great man to talk. He talked and talked and talked all day. Then the Parrot's son got a job in Fords, and he was called the Spadgy. <laughs> there was uh, balls of flour, there was shoulder of bacon, there was the quiet man, lovely man he was too, 
Um, oh, there was hundreds of them there. The one person that have to remember Johnny the Cock. He was the first man I met as a work, as a workmate, and he was a very, very nice man. He was a very innocent man, funnily enough. And the reason he was called Johnny the Cock was he always maintained he could do the perfect sound of a cock crying out. He would say like that the the the, the cocks in the, the model farm like weren't were useless like they weren't they, they were no good like they had the clue that he was the he was the one like you know and he then he'd start singing and of course there was a fierce ribbing over this and the big occasion then would have been Christmas. Jerry would take to the stage. They'd make up a stage for Jerry and he'd have a makeshift microphone and wire and all hanging out of it and this big and Jerry would start singing Puppet on the String. Now, Jerry thought he was a great singer, but Jerry hadn't a note in his head. And Jerry would start, and then he'd hold a note, well, if you could call it a note, or else he'd do the, the cock and he'd hold the note there. And the whole place would go ballistic. The people from the trim line would come, the chassis, the whole factory. Can you imagine 600 people and they're coming over to see Jerry the cock, like? The man had the note in his head, like, banging tools, banging dustbin lids, anything to make noise, like, a big chair, and Jerry was the star of the show. It was just magic, absolutely. So they put him into a talent competition in the Savoy at one stage, and they, to win the competition, uh, it was done on the, the, the clapometer system, where the, the loudest clap would win the competition. Jerry the Cock came out to do his party piece, which was imitate a cock. The audience was absolutely 60, 70% full of Ford workers, and he got the most rousing applause, and he won the competition. <laughs> so there was things like that, you know. There was um, there'd be parts coming little plastic bags, and when the bags would be empty, like a bag maybe about that size, fill the bag with water and sling it up in the air, cross the other side of the line, and some full of passing would get the contents down in his head. <laughs> And ring it through on one day and Paddy Murray got it down on top of his head. <laughs> he was the foreman. One morning, one of the one of the guys walking on the chassis line, Liam O'Neill, who like myself used to be a mechanic, he drove off the end of the line. He picked up a car at the end of the line, drove it out to park it outside, not knowing that there were brake parts missing and the car just didn't have any brakes. So he got to the end of the wharf, pressed the brake. Nothing happened, but Liam went down over the side. Very, very lucky somebody, um, somebody else was around. He was well able to swim anywhere. But there was somebody else there and um, pulled him back up onto the wall. Lucky to be saved. St and he's still around. <laughs> there was Black Jerry then. Uh, Dimmy Dam. Oh, there was names there. Paddy Grudge. <laughs> God almighty. <laughs> There was a lot of messing with that, to be quite honest with you, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, there was never anything nasty. Not that I remember, never anything nasty. It was all good natured and good humour. Um, and it was, it was taken in that spirit too. Well, we knew, we knew things were not good. There was a slowdown in um, in the economy anyway. Car sales were going down. From the very first uh, day of the uh, of the EEC, we knew that uh, part of the rationalisation program would be the uh, the removal of the ban on bringing in built up cars. Prior to that, what happened was that any company importing cars into Ireland had to have a manufacturing or some other plant within um, within Ireland so that they'd be left and we had a lot of restrictions that I'm not sure if it was Sean Lamas but certainly some of the earlier governments had these restrictions and it meant that if you were bringing in 10 vehicles you had to export 10 vehicles or you had to have manufacturing in the place so we were left to go so it was obvious that from the 1st of January 1985 to the best of my knowledge that all of the restrictions were going. There was there was constant rumours that the factory was going to close. Now it has been said like that this was done by Ford so it's been kind of 
like the rumours about the rumours that this was kind of circulated to prepare people that you know that it wasn't going to last forever but when it actually came I'd have to say the morning that I heard about the closure didn't expect it I had no idea and I, just a thing doesn't dawn on me that the place it was I didn't think it could or would I never knew never had any inkling whatsoever that, that Fords were closing and and if if I heard, I wouldn't have believed it because I couldn't see this this fantastic workplace going. I I felt that um, that the place wasn't going to stay open. There had been there had been rumours. There was a rumour which came from Paddy Hayes, the managing director. He had talked one time about about changing around from making cars to making possibly heaters or radiators or something like that, and. Um, and I, I had always hoped that something like that would have happened. And rather than build cars, we would have made components. I believe that they were closing it for a long time. Long time before they closed it. And, and like it was being mentioned, I think, abroad as well. Like, I mean, I mean they had that plants in Germany, I'm sure, and then Spain. And as I said, yeah, uh, if... If one of the Fords was still around at the time, it mightn't have been because it was the first plant, I think, outside America, the car plant. You know, there'd be a little bit of loyalty there for that, like. But I mean, like, like the, the car, the plant in Dagnum were probably doing a thousand a day, where we were only doing 90 a day, you know, so the, like the production wouldn't be big. The point was the factory was so small that it couldn't even support one robot. At that period, uh, a lot of the production in car plants all over the world, a lot of the work was being taken over by robots. And there were rumours around the place, buzzes as we knew them in Fords, that the man with the keys was coming. Every time an executive came in, the Fords, he was the man with the keys. The man with the keys was always going to be the man with the key to lock the gate and close the plant. In, in January um, 1984, we were all called to, um, to a meeting in the canteen. Everybody arrived up there, staff, workers, everybody. Well, as far as I was concerned, we were called up to the canteen. And I, and you know, a lot of people as well, assumed that it was some, something to do with the launch of a new car that was going to be announced. And we were addressed by the managing director, Paddy Hayes, at the time. And he told us that the factory was going to close down sometime in that year. So some people took it very, very badly. Others, like myself, were not surprised. I sort of expected it because I, I felt we had come to a natural end anyway. Um, some people were, were extremely upset. I tell you, you know, there was a lot of fellas there, and if I can remember rightly, when Paddy is said out they were closing down, there was a lot of tears coming into fellas' eyes. Because there was some of them lads never got a job after, like. I heard other people saying after that they, 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 they knew it was coming. I don't know, I didn't anyway. But as far as I was concerned, it was a bombshell. Shock. What do we do now? Where do we go from here? Because it's bad times. 1984, young family, just after buying a house across, across the road there, and uh, where do we go from here? He spoke for a while and he told, of, he uh, gave the background how Ford said in the previous 10 years invested 10 million and they'd invested 2 million in the state of the art uh, paint department back in 1967 and they put on big expansions and that. But in the previous 10 years, then they had put in 10 million, that was Irish pounds at the time, into trying to expand and um, uh, get other lines. They explored everything with the government to try and keep the plant open. They knew that the restrictions were being lifted and that the Fords could send in stuff. He apologised, he acknowledged the fact that there was, um, the plant had been working, the, the workers had did everything in their power to keep it open and that. 
the, the reaction was weird, actually, because some of them were actually, you know, the, 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 a lot of them were old. Uh, we, we were young, but the majority of them were older. The reaction actually is something that started clapping when he made the announcement. You know, a few people were saying, what's that about? Now, some people have said to me that people were clapping to say that Fords, some people were happy that the plant was closing. But I think that people appreciated that they were going over the precipice and at least the managing director faced people and told them, apologised, uh, did a roadmap of what had happened and why it happened. And um, he was, they were honest with them and that they had promised that they would do the best they could. So that was um, that. Some men were, were kind of happy in so far as if they were near retirement or they were getting a good package. And they looked at it like saying, well, you know, we're getting something, the place is going to go, like it's, you know. But I think younger people like myself and a lot of friends that were younger, uh, it didn't matter, families and everything. We were going to get compensation, of course. The package was, was going to be good at the time and all this like, but um, it didn't, at the time it didn't sink in. I think the worst, the worst thing I've experienced in that sense was the death of the plant. The plant didn't close immediately. It went on like something that was just terminal. Of course, uh, it was a thing that happened gradually. We were working, we were working on Sarah's and as the uh, orders were, were being fulfilled and as production was being wound down, you know, we eventually came to the last car. It started in the body shop. So the body shop was where the whole thing started. And bit by bit, like, there was less cars coming out. So where you had 10 cars an hour, it started with nine, eight. And as the weeks went by, it was maybe one car on its own, just moving along, creaking along in the lines. And it moving its way then into the paint shop and up into the trim line. And of course, we had, we had absolutely nothing to do. We were waiting for the car to come to work on it, like. And it was really a real death knell of a plant, like a plant that was so busy, that was so prosperous, that was, everything was happening inside, and the buzz was always there. There was always noise and machinery. There was people chattering, stuff being done. And then all of a sudden, there was just one car, one solitary car, until eventually, there was absolutely none. There was not a care to be seen. And you were just looking at the chains moving. And there was nothing there. It was gone. In August, August the 13th, on a Friday, the factory finally closed and uh, everybody just left the place. Most people just left empty handed the day that they arrived in the place and uh, a lot of people drifted off to various pubs around the place and uh, that was it, it was all over. We knew what was coming down the line and we were well prepared and the company had us well prepared but having said that, it was a sad day. Now, if I was retiring from work, that was one thing, the factory was there the next generation of workers will be coming along. You know it was there, and it was part of, the, part of the scenery, but to close down completely, I felt it was cutting a whole section of my life away. I turned around and I walked. We used to say the rosary there every day, midday, after lunch. On the very last day, as soon as we had the rosary finished, I didn't hang around the plant until half past four or five o'clock. I, I turned around and I walked out and I, I couldn't even turn back. Uh, it, it, it was that, like I was coming away from a funeral as if somebody had died. The complete stillness, I walked up that road on my own and I wouldn't even look back. It, it, it was traumatic. And even to this day, I still, I still feel the, the tears, you know, of, of having to leave all that behind. You know, and uh, that was that, like, towards the end of a story, towards the end of a long life. I, ha I had 42 years of working service there, but I had a life of connectivity to it, you know. So there you are, that was it. It 
had a huge impact on me. Um, I had to, I had to find a, a job. There was nothing available here, so I headed off to South Africa. I suppose it was a shock first of all, anyway. Like you know, and coming home and telling the the boss like what, what was happening. So you know, it was it was a bit of a, a shock, all right, like. Even like um, the children, I said, the eldest, or eldest child felt it as well, because she heard us talking in the house, whatever. I mean, to say, um, there, was, there, was no, there was no work around at the time. And the problem was, like in the 80s, the 80s was not a good time in Cork. Uh, Dunlop's plant went, Veromi went. Even like if you look at the uh, the trim line, there was over 600 people working in the lines. I think the figure officially was 600, 680 at one stage, if you included everybody. Like, but if you multiply that by a factor of two or three for the people that were supplying parts and ensuring that the factory functioned, I mean you were probably up to us 2,000 people in a small city like Cork. I was unlucky because I had a young family. I had five kids. So I need, no, the package that we got was reasonably good, but it doesn't, um, doesn't make up for the fact that you haven't got a job. You don't have the structure of going into work every morning at eight o'clock and, um, and having a, a wage that you can depend on, you know? Well, I mean, you, first of all, your wages were gone. In the meantime, it was very bad. Things were pretty bad around the city at that time. There wasn't much work around renting. And um, no, there were people who came out of it and they started businesses and all that, you know, small businesses of their own. I was a cyclist and we got a few quid, we got a few quid redundancy money and I set up a bicycle shop. That's what I did. So a lot of people would have worked, but maybe after five or six years, but there'd been quite a a lot of the people in their late fifties never worked again. But for the, the the vast number of people, the the it it had a huge impact. It changed their lives, it changed their lives completely. It was like a slow death. People started dying over um, the first year or two. You could pick up the, the echo every night and see that there was somebody else was dead. It seemed like it was going to keep on going until everyone was gone. There was some people, and there was some people didn't come outside the door again. It was, I you know, the place only closed. And there was two brothers, and they were, and uh, they were only living together. And the two of them passed away quite, quite quickly. And uh, like that now, um, you'd be. I think what I was surprised was some people they weren't that old when they died. People even in their forties were dying very, very young. And I, thought, I had always thought it strange is that people that retired from Fords at the age of 65, they were often dead before they got to 66 or 67. They never got to um, see any kind of a life after the place. And I didn't understand that. I, I thought maybe they were just burned out anyway. But I think what they missed is they missed the routine arriving there at 8 o'clock in the morning, making up their, their parts, their nuts and bolts and washers, and um, finishing up at half past five in the evening. They missed the routines, and I, I think that was in people's heads that they couldn't, um, they couldn't manage with all that, you know? I'd say, I'd say they just faded away. They just, you know, they, they, they certainly never, never worked again. And I'd say that, that they, they the impact of losing their jobs, I, I, because it, it was more than a job. It, it was it was more than a job. It was it was it was a way of life. It was a way of life, and when that's changed, I'd say it had a huge impact on, on, on those people. People were tied up with the production. Their minds were, were tied to production. It was still a car every eight minutes, and that applied to everything they did, even their, their sleeping time, I would think, was affected by this, you know. And maybe a lot of people just weren't adaptable enough. 
They didn't say, they didn't move around even from one area to the other. I mean, like we're in, we're in 30 feet, like they wouldn't have moved to, to, to working on another, in, another part, of another. We said working the, putting in the the, uh, the front panel or doing anything like that. They wouldn't be welding up a different. They were on the one thing. That was our job. That was every day. And I underlined then people who were in the same area. You know, they worked so far. They done the same thing. He would have had good money from the social welfare for, I think it was 15 months. So he would have been okay. But the biggest problem is he would have found it very hard to get a job because everybody was looking for work in the 80s in Cork. Apart from the fact that, that there was a big recession anywhere in the 80s, there was a feeling that people I worked in for us were blacklisted and that they couldn't get jobs anywhere. Some of the, some of the wiser ones invested their money in, in pubs and shops, that kind of thing. But an awful lot of people just could never get work again. Even though they were some of the most skilled people that you would ever find anywhere. They were never um, regarded as being very employable. It was generally said, and I just suppose generally accepted, that if you had worked in Fords, you weren't any good at anything else outside the Fords. You spent so long being industrialised and working in a certain atmosphere and been working on a certain, uh, a certain portion of work that you lost. Even good mechanics, they lost the skills that they would have had acquired working outside on general models of all sorts of cars and doing every general type of work. Working in Fords, I suppose we had a certain reputation of being uh, working to the to rules, you know, like unionised and whatever. And I suppose we mightn't have been um, that popular with uh, people outside if we were to get a job. They were regarded as being hotheads because we were always out on strike, which was not true. But every strike that was there was um, was a bit momentous and everybody knew about it. They would say, oh, force people are out and strike again. Which was very, very unfair, you know. Savage impact on the city. Dunlops was gone at the same time. Goldings were gone, the dockyard was gone. So the city was, was devastated, absolutely devastated. There wasn't a part of the city that wasn't affected by the closure of Fords. And then when you had two other major employers as well, gone. I mean, it affected, it affected the city centre hugely. People like wouldn't have had, for a time they had the money when they had their redundancy payment or what have you, things went along for a while. But that all, that all impacted hugely on the city. The spending like was, would have been cut away back, I suppose, really. You know, it was uh, even, um, even the, 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 the paper man that used to be outside the gate, like he, I mean, he suffered too because there was papers bought every morning. Well, it was badly missed, like. But I, I drove in there not too long ago, and I said there's more working there now than there was in my time. Because there's, there's a lot of smaller jobs uh, working there now, I think. The whole area, the, all these buildings have changed very, very dramatically. Um, there's very, very little that is the same, apart from some of these yellow railings and that kind of thing. The floors have changed, they've filled in the, um, the pits that, that, the, that the cars went over and um, all the old machinery has gone out of the place, obviously. They put walls and panels in what used to be a big open area in where the cars were manufactured. All the lines have been removed, of course. But, you know, life goes on and there's probably more people working down the Ford plant now when, with, with the smaller units that are down there than they never worked there in our time. So, you know, this changes. Come back, Henry Ford, to our land. When you were there, you gave us a helping hand. But now we're out of labour, 
We got no checks of paper that you used to shout, Henry Ford. And you came from Detroit, Henry Ford. The country boys came to Henry Ford. But now we're under the purse, we're scrounging for our suppers. Oh, come back again, Henry Ford. For when you forsake us, all the pubs forsook us. Oh, come back again, Henry Ford. Since you shut down, Henry Ford, we trapped all over town, Henry Ford. But true to tell, I'm wearing well and knocking out airy times. But time moves on, our friends are gone, and the songs of the night will pass. So we'll drink to our health, tis our only wealth, when they're pulling us out on grass. Yo! Yeah. Oh. 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 Oh.